Let me show you something that I find amazing. <laughs> what I'm referring to specifically is that this little guy is learning to walk and interact with the world around him. This is, of course, perfectly normal, but that doesn't make it any less remarkable. You know, when we walk, we use about 200 muscles in our bodies. Each muscle can be activated or relaxed. So in a way, this is like driving a car that has 200 gas pedals. And at the same time, we have to worry about the complexity of our environment, we have to worry about maintaining balance, and so on. And it begins with the baby's first steps, but humans and animals have a huge repertoire of skilled, agile, and graceful motions that we can perform with these most of the time without even thinking about it. I spent the better part of the past six years trying to model the principles that allow humans and animals to move, and in so doing, I've gained an appreciation for how complex a process this is, and that's what I would like to share today. Let's start by looking at how we might model a human. To approximate our skeletal structure, we can assume that we are made up of rigid body parts connected to each other by joints. We can then run a physics simulation with the setup, and we get this. So this, it's a ragdoll, it's a lifeless puppet, because the muscles and their actions are missing. And of course, all of our motions are driven by muscles. Now, the effect of muscles is easy to simulate, because all they do is apply forces that act on our skeletal structure, but the interesting problem is how they all have to work in unison in order to produce coordinated motions. Because this is a difficult problem, it's always helpful to start with something simple. So in this case, we began by looking at a very basic human activity, standing. When you look at people that stand around, it seems like they're just maintaining an upright posture. So we can place virtual muscles on our simulated human and ask them to do the same, just keep their bodies straight. <laughs> Turns out that doesn't work so well, and that's because even though we don't see it, our muscles are constantly working to adjust and correct our posture. Let's take a closer look at this problem. As, or when standing, humans are inherently unstable because the center of mass is high above our feet. This means that the gravitational forces that act on our bodies cause air in our postures to grow quickly. In this case, as the simulated human begins to fall forwards, it needs to move its center of mass back. And according to Newton's first law of motion, it can only do so by manipulating or by changing the forces that the feet are applying onto the ground. This is, of course, not something that we have direct control over, but rather we need to change the activation of the muscles throughout our body in order to achieve this. I won't go into the technical details of how we simulate this, but once the behavior is implemented, the simulated human can stand, and now we can ask it to do various motions, like shift its weight from side to side, or squat down, or perform many other motions. And through all this, it is able to maintain balance and it doesn't fall over. <laughs> now, the next step is to ask it to repeatedly take one foot off the ground and make sure it doesn't fall over it while it's doing so. And then at the end, take one foot off the ground after the other. And we're almost there in terms of walking. So as you can see here, it's not very good at maintaining balance when pushed. And by the way, when I show this video to people, they sometimes think I'm mean for doing this. But in fact, there's a very good reason for such torture tests. In our day-to-day -day lives, we often trip, bump into other people, uh, slip on ice, and so on. And most of the time, we can recover balance and we keep on walking. And we want our simulated humans to be able to do the same. Now, when for whatever reason people do start falling over, one of the most common strategies to recover balance is to take a protective step. In general, computing an optimal location for where to step is a very difficult problem, but it turns out we can use a simple mathematical approximation to compute this. Once we know where the simulated human should step, we have to implement the necessary strategies that ensure that it can take that step safely and it doesn't fall over too early. And this is what we get with when we put all of this together. Here, we ask it to walk at about a meter per second, which it does by modulating the ground reaction forces at the feet, just like it did when it was standing. 
And now as we throw these heavy balls at it, it is constantly adjusting the location of the footsteps, and it's able to recover balance and keeps on walking. <laughs> now, so far, I focused a lot on functionality. That is, making sure that these simulated humans can walk reliably without falling over. But there's a lot more to human motion than that. They reflect our personality, our state of mind, or injuries that we might have. So in order to get our simulated humans to be more human-like, we will have to take such things into account. This is still an open problem to a large extent, <laughs> but as shown here, we can create endless motion styles through physical simulation. <laughs> Simulating humans is a lot of fun, but I've always been inspired by animals. So for that reason, I also wanted to look into modeling the motion of four-legged creatures. Now, in principle, the same tools that we apply to control the motions of bipedal characters are also useful here. But not everything worked perfectly from the start when we started to simulate this, uh, this dog. Here's what one of our initial motions looked like. It's successful from the point of view that the dog doesn't fall over, but it doesn't look very natural. <laughs> to address this, we made use of some video data that we had access to. The dog in this picture has markers placed on anatomical landmarks, and by tracking these markers through the video stream, we were able to reconstruct its motion. We then placed markers on the corresponding locations on our simulated dog, and that gave us a way of comparing the motions that came from the video data with the motions that we got from simulation. We then use this information to optimize each gate and bring it as much in line with the motion data as possible. And as shown here, the resulting motions end up looking a lot more uh, realistic. To test the robustness of these locomotion controllers, here we asked the dog to walk over variable terrain. And it doesn't always look natural, but it doesn't fall over, which is what we were after. In this case, it's doing very little motion planning. It is only adjusting the height of each step so that it doesn't trip. The simple strategy is not always effective, especially when it is moving at higher speeds. This example, and many like it, show us just how much we have to learn before we can hope to match the skill of real animals. Now, the lessons that we have learned so far, however, are directly applicable to legged robots. This robot was designed and built by a team at ETH Zurich, and about a year ago, we started working together to use the control strategies that we developed for simulated creatures in order to get this robot walking. Here, we introduced variations in the terrain that the robot doesn't know about, and it's just reacting to them and trying not to fall over. Now, remember that um, we threw balls at our simulated creatures to see how well they can recover balance. It turns out hardware breaks when you do that, so instead here we just push it by hand, and um, we found that it's able to recover balance pretty well most of the times. Now, I've talked a bit about how it is that we try to model the principles underlying human and animal motion, but a good question is, why is this worth doing in the first place? Well, here are some reasons. First, there is an ever-increasing demand for realism and lifelike characters in today's movies and video games, and most character animations that we see are either created by hand, this is a very tedious process where animators have to pose a character over and over and over, or through motion capture, where an actor performs a motion that is played back as needed. With physics simulation and models of motor control, like the ones I've briefly talked about, virtual characters can move on their own, and it's my hope that in the future they will become the ideal virtual actor. I've briefly shown that this work is applicable to legged robots, and I think that as the more we learn about the processes that give rise to motions in humans and animals, the, um, the more reliable and skilled the next generations of legged robots will be. These robots can then be used for a lot of different applications, ranging from search and rescue 
to robotic companions that are specifically designed for children or, or the elderly. The control strategies that we use for simulated creatures or robots can also be potentially implemented directly into prosthetic devices or exoskeletons with the promise of helping people overcome physical disabilities. In the end, it's clear that there's a lot of work that needs to be done before we can achieve these objectives. But hey, everything begins with baby steps. Thank you.